I don't know if all of you know Galen. Many of you that have been around here, you do know Galen, I know. Uh, Galen is, uh, uh, used to say about the uh, James in the early church that he was one of the pillars of the church. This is one of the pillars of Emmanuel Baptist Church, Galen, right here. Uh, I don't know of anyone who loves the Lord more, but I also uh, know, uh, know very few who have uh, uh, known the Lord through suffering and difficulty. And I love Galen. Galen's been one of my dads in the faith over the course of my life. Uh, he served as an active elder uh, here at Emmanuel for a long time uh, and uh, has taken a seat back, and he's our, our, our elder emeritus, if there is such a thing, uh, in terms of that. Uh, but we want him to come, and, and uh, one of the places that, that uh, I've known Galen and where he has made an impact on my life in a number of ways is uh, first talking to him about the, the, the Ecclesiastes oh, yeah. and uh, talking about the, the wisdom literature it's called in the Old Testament, Psalms and Proverbs. And so he's come to speak in, on Psalm 84, and I just wanted to give him a little extra That's shout great. out today because Thank I love him doing that, today. Uh-huh. Well, that's encouraging. When I saw Greg and Rana come in, uh, I was really encouraged and just by seeing them because... Uh, all of us suffer, and uh, there's uh, the psalmist says you go through the valley of Baca. It, just, it sounds like tobacco coming out of your mouth, doesn't it? Tobacco, Baca. There are many capable men who could be up here, and uh, hopefully some of them, the spirits working on their heart, you know, and getting them encouraged to come up here and speak as well. Um, we all have places we meet with God. One of my places is on the patio, uh, on our back patio. We have a porch swing back there. I don't usually sit on the swing, just the chair. But it's a special time uh, to just uh, chat with uh, the Father, the beautiful one. And uh, when you're going through those head battles, you know, and that self-talk, uh, it's a clear indication that we're uh, walking spirits, aren't, isn't it? Uh, now, you see an old, old ghost up here, but if you think about it, how many ghosts have you seen with false teeth and on crutches and things like that? So I'm the same age you are. Just, you see the vessel, you see the clay, right? But my spirit is a baby. I mean, it's, I, I know, it, it's, it's tough, tough life. But that 2 Corinthians chapter 4 passage, don't look on the seen, look on the unseen, because the seen, that's temporal. The unseen, that's eternal. You see, and, and Paul speaks in terms of two people. I'm two people. The old person is decaying, atrophied, entropy, depreciation, whatever, double declining balances if you're an accountant. But the inside, whoa, flexing the biceps, you know getting stronger. So as I'm on the patio uh, talking to the Lord, two things, and I'm, I'm wanting to stay up with your blanks there. I'm feeling lonely and homesick. Now, I've been married to Claudia 56 years. How many days, honey? Oh, let's see, 28th. We'll been married, and somebody else has got an anniversary too, but my anniversary is coming up here in a few days, 56 years. A beautiful woman, a beautiful companion. And yet, there's something, this eternal spirit that's in me that longs to go home, to be free of the space that dynamics and the constraints of the physical and the head battles that I face all the time in the spirit, which you guys face too, the battles, the, the smoke. Sometimes the gun smoke's so thick in the spiritual battle that you can't even see straight. I mean, you're just battling, and your kids battle. And, and so I realized that loneliness, that we're eternal embodied spirits, restless in time and space constraints. We long to be free. That sets up within me a yearning, a craving, almost a crying, an overwhelming desire to be with him. There's a lot of things we need today. 
So that's first blanks. I think we're loneliness and homesickness. We need the word. We need truth. Absolute truth. And I like the way Greg uh, defines absolute goodness. But we need that. Uh, we need beautiful music. That lifts our spirits. Um, we need wonderful fellowship. I like hugs and loves. and I, It's just who I am. I, not all of us are huggers. And, and then some of us need drugs. I mean caffeine. Um, <laughs> so, you know, kind of... The scriptures are very clear. Be filled with the spirit and not the spirits. S and S. So you're to be filled with the spirit of the living God, but not the spirits. But anyway, I've got some coffee in me already. So, um, so what do we need? You need this morning to worship. Without worship, we shrivel up and die. So does an individual so goes the society, so goes the nation. If they don't have absolute truth, they're going fuzzy. I mean, goofy. Uh, like uh, Jill, my sweet sister, said, the ducks, the ducks don't follow, the ducks are going everywhere. And uh, morally speaking, the ducks are going everywhere, right? Because there's no absolute, infinite reference point. We need to touch the transcendent one, the infinite one, the eternal one, Adonai, Yahweh, Jehovah. This morning, you need to worship. I don't, that's my driving force. You need to touch God. He's the beautiful one, the lovely one, gorgeous. Father, you're gorgeous. And we need to touch him this morning. The psalmist in 84 has set pilgrimage to Zion. And I'm going to take a little homiletical ratchet here because I'm going to break away. It's, it's difficult. I wanted to set the context of the pilgrim. It's a pilgrim song. It's a journey song. It's a traveling song. Not to Colorado or Alaska or Hawaii. This is the pilgrimage to Zion. But I want it because I think it'll enhance our understanding, enhance our knowledge, uh, our feel for this psalm. I want to take a little homiletic. I call it a homiletic. Homiletic just means delivery of the text uh, versus hermeneutics, which is the study and interpretation of the text. And I want to take a little uh, study of the psalms. So the Psalter is uh, Israel's prayer and praise book where we find Psalm 84, the pilgrimage song, the man who's going to Zion, the Jewish man. Authorship, about half of it's David, a sixth of it's the Korites, and then Aesop has a psalm or two, and then so does Moses and Solomon. The timing of the writings during the United Monarchy, so you had Saul, and then you had um, David as king, and then you had Samson as king, as, yes, yeah, Solomon, thank you. And then you had the uh, Jeremiah, or um, Jeroboam, Rehoboam, and the 722 carrying away to Assyria, and then I think 586 carrying away into Babylon. Well, where did the Psalms fit? The Psalms fit in the United Monarchy uh, with David and Solomon. Types of Psalms? Ours is a pilgrim in each psalm. Uh, you may, it may initially just come to your mind, Pilgrim's Progress. And that's what pilgrim psalms are. They're traveling songs. They're journeying songs. Very common motif, uh, genre, literature, are traveling. Because we all travel. They didn't travel too far on donkeys and horses and things like that, but... We all have these traveling things. So you have lament psalms. Those are uh, set to a minor key. They're a funeral dirge. They're psalms of tears. You have thanksgiving songs, grateful songs, and precatory psalms where you're calling down judgment on your enemies. And then you have creation psalms, which I really love, psalms like 8, 19, 104. And then you have these pilgrimage psalms or ascent psalms. The reason is sometimes they use ascent psalms it's because Jerusalem sets higher in altitude 
So when the pilgrims were going towards Zion, towards Jerusalem, towards the temple and the temple mount and so on, the altar, they were coming uphill, kind of ascent. So they're sometimes called ascent songs. And we're in the pilgrimage uh, group of psalms. Psalms are written in Hebrew poetry style. The grandeur and beauty of the psalms come out of the heart and the agony of emotion. English poetry we're familiar with. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar's sweet, and so are you. That's English poetry. You're trying to rhyme things. Or take uh, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. That was King Richard III. Most of the way they uh, bickered, which the Democrats and Republicans don't do today, was through you did you did a rhythm song or a rhyming psalm, and that's what Humpty Dumpty is. It's King Richard the Three and his his fall in uh, England. So the psalms are written. Uh, with parallelism of thought, not rhyming. So I used to say roses are red, violets are blue to Claudia, your eyes don't bother you, but they bother me. That was a, kind of a twist on the roses are red, violets are blue thing. But the, the, the Hebrew or Hebraic poetry, of which Psalm 84 is a beautiful example, uh, uses parallelism of thought, not rhyming. So you have synonymous parallelism, antithetical parallelism. Uh, synonymous parallelism means you have a first line and the second line modifies the first line. Um, then I'm, and I'm going to give you some examples of this just in a moment here. And then antithetical parallelism, you have a first line and the second line is in contrast to the first line. Um, it also uses a lot of word pictures. So parallelism of thought characterizes Hebraic poetry in the Psalter and also the use of word pictures. I call it campfire talk. It's the talk that you do around the campfire or at the coffee hub or over the kitchen table. It's not fancy talk. Um, I, I talked to Drew, uh, Drew Brads and I said, Drew, most of you know Drew has quick hands, right? But if you want to say that in a picture, I said to Drew, I said, Drew, if we met for sarsaparilla in the old days down in Laredo and I spilled my uh, sarsaparilla on you and you got mad and you said, hey, we're going to draw down on this baby. So we walk outside and when the chime hits 12 or the bells hit 12, we draw and I said, before the, uh, my iron can clear my leather, I'll have six holes in me. <laughs> or I'll look like Swiss cheese. Now, that's the way the poetry is. It's written in language that we can all understand better than just saying Drew has quick hands. So, and I, I didn't think Drew would be offended or I'd ask him, Andy, about that thing. So parallelism thought use of word pictures uh, are, are the way that the Hebrews talk. They don't try to rhyme stuff. Uh, interpretation of the hermeneutics or, or the hermeneutics of the psalm. You must engage your emotions. Take baby powder, baby oil and rub it on your spirit right now. Take baby lotion and rub it on your spirit. Feel these psalms. Get into these psalms. You've got to give soft, open emotions because that's the way they're written. Number two, I think it's, uh, I'm going with your outline. Uh, don't exclude your cognitive, your noose, your noeo, your mind. Don't exclude your mind. I mean, if I went just by my emotions, I'd still be in bed right now. You can't, you can't rely on your feelings. We used to say they're the caboose, but nobody knows what a caboose is anymore. You got the locomotive, you got the coal car, then you got the caboose. Feelings have to trail the will and the power and the strength of the text. Uh, but when it comes to the Psalms, don't set aside the pathos. 
for the ethos and the uh, logos. You engage them all three, and you do put that baby lotion on your spirit. Because it's that type of, you've got to be uh, engaging your emotions, your mind, and your imagination, sanctified. You always got to be sure you're relying on the text and you're not going too far allegorically away from the text. Uh, but you've got to use your imagination. I remember when Alora was young and uh, we would play imagination. You lay on your back and you look up at the ceiling and then you imagine something. Probably some of you have done this. And uh, Alora said, she was two years old, three, I don't know what it, she said, Papa, she said, I see a pink elephant with blue ears. And I said, well, I see the GDP falling and a, and a graft with derivatives, uh, first and second derivatives, sometimes a third derivative. What? Papa, you got this thing goofy. You know, you got to see the pink elephants and blue ears. You, you got to see that in the Psalms. Live them, love them, get into them. They'll swallow you theologically alive. They're so beautiful. So examples, just a couple, and then I'm going to drop back into 84. Psalm 1, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sin. I hope I'm not cutting across somebody else's psalms. I don't know who's doing what. Uh, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, but disjunctive. Now here comes an antithetical comment. That's the way the Hebrew Brews wrote poetry. They didn't try to rhyme anything. They said, okay, but his delight, that delight drives everything else. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And it says he will be like a tree. Do you hear the picture? A sequoia? A red oak? You get it? A maple tree? Sugar maple? Tap that thing, get that syrup out of it? Live these psalms. Love these psalms. So he'll be like a tree. But the wicked, here come the disjunctive again. But the wicked, antithetical parallelism. They're not that way. They're like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Psalm 2. The nations, they're in an uproar. Are they today? Are they at war? The nations are in an uproar. The Lord laughs. It's, I think, the only place, and I may have to check with the men or some of the other, I think laughing for God, it's a, it's a laugh of derision. It's not a ha-ha-ha. It's a, yeah, you guys do what you want to do. I'm going to take care of you. Kiss the sun. Hear, do you hear the picture? That, it's not like a sloppy kiss. That's doing homage. That's, I'm going to honor you, Father. I'm going to love you, Father. You're such a joy, Father. That's kissing the sun. That's what, you hear the pictures. So beautiful. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's Jesus. That's a Christological or a prophetic psalm. My God, my God, he's on the cross. Psalm 22, you talk about theology in the psalms. My God, my, he couldn't say my father. He couldn't say Abba. He certainly didn't say dad. Dad, why have you forsaken me? Psalm, Isaiah 53 says, it pleased the father to crush his son. It uses a word of crushing grapes under your feet. How, Father, can I understand that yet you will crush your son for me? But that's what, my God, don't you say, Abba, my dad, my father, no, my God, I'll obey. Not this cup, let it pass. No, the atoning, vicarious, substitutionary work of God, his sacrifice, Psalm 22. Psalm 56, put my tears in your bottle. Psalm 29, the Sirocco, the winds coming off the Mediterranean, they'll tear down trees. But they make the calf, it says in Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord makes the hind deer to calve. 
What quickens the mother? All, these doctors all want to know what t tells the baby to come out. What quickens the mother? The feelings in the mother. Well, look at Psalm 29. The voice of the Lord. It's the Sirocco. It's, it's making a parallel with the wind coming off the Mediterranean. And it's saying, the voice of the Lord makes the hind or the deer to calve. What a sweet, beautiful psalm. And then Psalm 33, I just can't resist this, and I've done this before, but it says, Psalm 33, I'm just another example. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Now, how did God make the heavens? Well, and by the breath of his mouth, their host. For he spoke, and bing, it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. So here is my imagination. God standing on the threshold of history and he goes, poof, Ursha Major. Poof, Ursha Minor. Poof, maybe poof, 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 seven sisters. Octurus, poof. Sagittarius, poof. Early, late earth, at least from Psalm 29 and Dr. Whitcomb, who I had for Genesis, it's instant, he just pops it up there. And that's what the text says, for he spoke and it was done. Bara, the Hebrew. He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Oh, time, with Psalm 51, the first sermon I ever preached was on the sacrifices of God are a broken heart and a contrite spirit thou will not despise. Now it's not that he took away from the sacrificial system because he didn't. The sacrificial system is the portal through which you see the cross. And some people will say, oh, okay, that sacrificial system was no good. It's Psalm 51, 38, 32, 36. No, the sacrificial system was the way we see the propitiatory work of Christ, his sacrifice for you and me. His dying on the cross, the lovely one, the beautiful one. That's the way we see it, is, is through that sacrificial system that he put in place and he honored it. So in Psalm 51, yes, the psalmist wanted to offer him a whole bunch of stuff. The coffee that he overuses, golf clubs maybe they, that he adores and idolizes, the new car. He wants to give him all kinds of sacrifices. But after he breaks and he says, my heart is broken, then he comes right back and says, offer me some sacrifices. So he, he, he honors the sacrificial system. Now I want to drop back into Psalm 84, and I knew it would be a digression. Um, Psalm 84, three stanzas, three strophes. He uses the term stanzas and strophes. It's like a song, because they're called the Psalms. Here are the three strophes, or the strands, that run through Psalm 84. Um, number one is a longing and a yearning. Number two is a journey. And number three is uh, Zion. Uh, Spurgeon says Psalm 84 is the pearl of the Psalms. And I don't know, I go back to my loneliness. 56 years of marriage, I'm homesick, wanting to go back to Kansas. Who would want to go back to Kansas? It's hotter than there it is here. But my heart wants to go back to Tonganoxie. That's where my family's buried. I'm the last one of the group. And, and I want to go to Maple Hill and sit at the Stone Bridge. There's a hill. It's called Maple Hill. And at top of the hill, don't think Estes Park or the Rockies. <laughs> hills in Kansas, a little bigger than that hills. But sitting up on this hill, uh, there's a valley and a train track runs down through the valley. And when I'm sitting on the stone bridge, uh, stone uh, church, which is the, uh, the center of the cemetery there, I can hear the train whistle way off in the distance coming down the valley. <laughs> I long for you, Father. Like Simeon said, oh, Father, let me my soul depart. Sometimes I just want to be free. Not right now. I don't think he's saying it to me right now. I don't want to get too dramatic. 
But I long for him. I long for the beauty and the loveliness and the lack of constraints in my physical and spiritual. There's a longing for the beautiful one, for the lovely one. So that's Psalm 84 is going to be this longing, this yearning, a deep craving. You can just hear it. Let me read first four verses now. How beautiful, how amiable, how lovely are the tabernacles of the Lord of hosts. My soul longeth, yea, it even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh, they cry out for the living God. Yea, even the sparrow. A sparrow is always pictured as kind of a cheap bird and not too expensive, but God's got his eye on the sparrow. And the swallow, he kind of flitters around. And probably they were in the eaves of the temple, um, the Solomonic temple. They're probably up there in the eaves. They made their nests. And uh, so that's why he mentions the sparrow. And then he mentions the swallow where she may lay her young, nesting instinct, even to thine altars, O Lord of hosts and king. Blessed are they that dwell in thy house. They will still be praising thee, see law. See law, everything you read, it's either a pause, a crescendo, a musical interlude, but it's, it's a nice division because this psalm has 12 verses. Four is the craving Four is the journey, and four, I'm at home. So it's got that nice breakdown. Well, think of some of the things that we yearn for. Food. Um, I like warm apple pie, a la mode. Ice cream. Mouth waters for hot homemade cinnamon rolls. Um, think, think of the, the sinful things that we overdo. It's so alcohol. Drugs, pornography, they all have this craving. Um, and it makes up more than 50% of the pleasure, the utility that comes out of these things. Uh, there, there is a craving for evil. There, there's, you can't get around that. And there's a craving for a good steak at Longhorn. Uh, with I, David used to say, A1 sauce put on it and get your mouth watering. Well, that's the psalmist. The psalmist is up at Mount Hermon. Uh, he's up where the uh, headwaters of the Jordan start. He's up there where uh, Syria and Palestine kind of come. He's, he's longing, the psalmist is, craving, yearning, desiring to go home, to go down to the altar in Jerusalem at the the temple. You almost have to define what we mean by homesickness. Uh, It used to be when I was initially homesick, it was for uh, Ohio, or not me, for Kansas for me. It was a piece of dirt, real estate, you know, a state. You long for New Jersey, where Barbara's from. You long for wherever the state was that you were born in. that, that was homesickness. Then when I got married to Claudia, my homesickness was for a person. It shifted from dirt to Claudia. Oh, don't want to compare those two. Claudia, she, I'm homesick for her. And when God takes her or takes me, it'll be difficult. But then, ultimately, homesickness is for something bigger, eternal is for God. I want to go home. That's homesickness. And then Zion. Zion takes on different meanings in different contexts. Zion can be Jerusalem. Zion can be the temple. Zion can be the temple mount. Zion can be the altar at the temple. Zion. But it's, but, but the key is for this psalmist, this pilgrim, this Jewish traveler, Zion is where Theos is, God. That's where God's at. That's where God's at. Jehovah, Adonai, Yahweh. That's where he's at. He's at the temple in Zion. So we do have a theological quandary here. And it's 
a, a, a theological ineptness on the part of the traveler, on part of the pilgrim, on part of the Jew who's up there at Mount Hermon, which is a ski resort, I understand, about 10,000 feet high, snow-capped, and is the only ski resort in Israel. But this is where he's at. This is where the Jewish traveler of Psalm 84, he's up there in Mount Hermon. I don't think he's skiing, but that's where he's at. And uh, he's localized, not omnipresent. So he has, I think that's your blanks, um, uh, to our psalmist, God is localized, he's not omnipresent. Now I think it's good to have a place where you meet with God. But the psalmist is kind of has this idea that God is only in one place. He's down there in Jerusalem. He's in Zion. He's at the altar. That's where God's at. And I got to get there. Now we know something else, don't we? We know that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present at all times in all places. And his control is over his whole kingdom, the whole creation. God is everywhere everywhere. He may behave differently in different areas, but he's fully and completely and holy. He's everywhere. I mean, he's completely holy and completely everywhere at all times. And so you, you kind of have to work with that in the psalm, uh, this Psalm 84, because the psalmist is traveling there. God makes accommodations for this. And I, uh, two, there was a scripture that I wanted to find and I found it. And it was uh, a accommodation by God for Naaman in 2 Kings chapter 5. Um, in 2 Kings chapter 5, uh, the general's name is uh, Naaman. He's a Syrian general. And the Syrians have been making inroads or cross-boundary raids at night. So they sneak over the border. And they raid Israeli camps and things. And then they take captives. So Naaman was leading one of these raids and they went across from Syria border across over into Israel. They got this little Jewish girl. I don't, we don't know age, nine, ten, I don't know age. Um, but, and they brought this little Jewish girl back into Syria. Well, Naaman has uh, leprosy. He gets leprosy. The text is not quite clear, but he has leprosy. And the little girl says to her master, or perhaps he, she said it to the master's wife, and then the master's wife said it to the master in this context. But the, the little Jewish girl said, I know a prophet in Israel, and he can cure you. Whoa. Now that struck home to the Syrian general. And so he went with, uh, with uh, the little girl and they went over into Israel with a great entourage and I don't know whether they didn't get ambushed or something, but he's going back to Israel now with wanting to be cured, Armand. And so when he, he gets cured by Elijah, Elisha, when he gets cured, uh, of his leprosy, he says this, I want to take two mule loads of Israeli dirt, ground, and I want to haul it back over here to Syria so that when I bow down with my master, he, he had a master, uh, to worship Ramon, which is the word for Baal, false god. He said, I'll be able to bow down on Israeli dirt. And this is a tickle the hooey out of me. It just, here's a man that wants to take Israeli dirt back. So he, when he bows down to a false god with his master, he can be on Israeli dirt. So God sees that it's an accommodation by God. And God says, okay, we'll, we'll let you do that through the prophet and so on. You can take some, <laughs> a mule can carry about 150 pounds of dirt. So I'm thinking 300 pounds of dirt. He's kneeling down to Ramon, Baal, or the Asherims, or whatever he's doing. He's bowing down. Now, another accommodation was Thomas. You remember this. Thomas wasn't with the disciples the first time they saw the resurrected Christ. And he said, uh, unless I see, Thomas said, doubting Thomas, 
and unless I see the nail prints in the hands, and unless I see the spear in the side, hey, I'm not going to believe. Well, now God could say, okay, he didn't. Jesus said, I will accommodate. I'll meet you where you're at. I'll accommodate you. And so he did. And Thomas cried out, oh, my Lord and my God, after he saw him. And he said, put your hand here, hand and inside. And Jesus said to him, because you've seen, you believe. Blessed are those who, what, have not seen, and yet they believe. That's us. We have not seen, but boy, do we ever believe, don't we? Hopefully. They who did not see yet believed. Well, with the sparrow and the swallow, he has the homing instinct. One last thing, and I'm going to part two, and I'm kind of watching some things here. Uh, part two, anything in the physical world is decaying. I'm decaying. You can kind of see some decay, can't you, in my hair? And, and I got a titanium knee. That's decay. Rick, thank you. Rick, I said, Rick, if I fall down coming up here, will you help me? And Rick says, yeah, I was supposed to build something for you. Thankful, Rick, and thankful for the men to give me this opportunity. And thankful to the singers. Thankful. Oh, so my heart is overwhelmed with thanksgiving for the Father, for the God. He's beautiful. So anything in the physical metaphysic, I like the word metaphysic. I know it's a three foot long word. It just means beyond the material or over the material or it means the spirit world. Ah, metaphysic. And everything decays. It entropy. Attrition, depreciation. It doesn't matter whether you, you, it's a turtle, he decays. A person, he decays. A, a, a loaf of bread, it decays. Mold, everything decays. And economists study that stuff. Some of you know I have dual training theologically and economically. And so we have called the Law of Diminishing Returns. And Greg gave me a book, Living Life Backwards, from, on Ecclesiastes. And I've read most of it, Greg. And I enjoyed it, but he says the same thing. Everything in the physical world has decay. We used to use the idea of um, a material thing that you overconsumed because you're trying to get eternal stuff out of a material thing. So if I eat too much food, gluttony, if I drink too much alcohol, uh, you have a problem. Yeah. So if you try to get out of a physical thing, eternal value, you're going to come up short because that stuff is decaying. And back to Paul in Second Corinthians, he says, you know, what is unseen is eternal, but what is seen is temporal. Uh, and then he divides the person into two people, your spirit and your physical body. Well, I once I had uh, Shauna. She was young, and we were uh, having, I think it was Thanksgiving, and we were, I was trying to teach this principle, the law of diminishing returns, that affects everything physical. Everything's decaying. Everything's wearing away. And, and I said, uh, and Shauna was over there, and she started eating black olives. And I said, honey, you're hitting increasing returns right now and then constant returns and then you're going to get diminishing returns. Well, she kept eating black olives and then I heard <laughs> like that. She threw up. I said, that's negative returns. To, on that. And the pieces of olives were still in it. It had turned, time to digest. But what's driving my homesickness and my craving and the psalmist craving is the desire for God. The author uses wine, the text uses wine. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is debauchery or excess or dissipation. 518 Ephesians. But be filled with the Spirit. So again, don't be filled with spirits. Be filled with the Spirit, S and S there. 
And then the scriptures say, too much wine, do not be heavy, go with heavy drinkers of wine or with gluttonous eaters. Gluttonous eaters, heavy drinkers of wine. You, you, you get the feeling of depreciation and entropy and all that stuff. And then it says, those who linger over wine, uh, don't look on wine when it's red and it sparkles. So the text is not outlawing wine, but the text is giving some very careful precautions on oios of uh, their wine. Ecclesiastes says, well, and then he uses honey. He says, my son, eat honey. It's good. Yes, honey is good from the comb. It's sweet to your taste. But have you found honey? Eat only what you need that you do not have it to excess and vomit it. That's true of all of the physical world. You can't get the eternal out of the physical. Well, in verse, uh, chapter, uh, second section of the Psalm 5 to 8, it says, How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion, passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rains also cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before the God of Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give faith. Baca. You know it when you're in it. Some of you are there now. Baca means dry, thirsty, uh, sometimes related to the valley of weeping. What happens in the valley when you're going through it? And some of you are there now. And it, it, it repeats. It's not just one time through the valley of Baca. It, God will take you through there more than once. Well, reality, your reality slams right into your theological constructs. Now that's, I mean, You've got your theology and you've got all those ducks in a row and then God takes you through the valley of Baca and yet your reality just pops right into the theological constructs that you have. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm just saying he's going to test you. You're thirsty for life. He takes you deeper. You feel lonely. You feel helpless. You feel afraid and you feel vulnerable in Baca. And yet God is there. He's there by faith. You uh, apprehend spiritual reality. You approach spiritual reality. He's there. He's in the valley of Baca. And he says it in the text. He says, as you walk through the valley of Baca, turn around. And guess what's happened? Your tears have fallen into the soil of life because you're hurting so bad and, the, and then as you turn around it's all flowers it's gorgeous it's got intergenerational and generational attributes the beauty of walking through Baca and turning around that's why memory is important now you got to learn to dissect your memories dissect memories there's thorns in those memories but dissect it and pull out the kernel. God intends, God says, I cause all things to work together for good and those who love me called according to purpose. And he says in, in, in um, another place, Genesis, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And he says in another place, in Ecclesiastes, so beautiful, appropriate. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Dissect those memories. There are thorns in the memory. They hurts. You're vulnerable. Dissect your memories. Don't throw them out. Dissect them and live with those. So God takes us through, um, but turn around, look behind, and there's the beauty of our God. So as you pass through the Baca, you make it a place of spring. You go through it in such a way that others are encouraged and blessed and see you go through it. And yippee, skippy peanut butter. I mean, it's exciting to live the Christian life. And uh, then we're finally at home. 
to God's dwelling place, the altar. And he says, it sounds like Paul, doesn't it? That last passage, uh, uh, 9 through 12, I count all things but loss. Or I, I'm going to borrow from Greg Aesop in seventy three seventeen. until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord. I hope for you this morning one thing that you will worship the beautiful one that you will be worship the altogether lovely one the men will play that song that'd be great